give us a tour. Tell us about here. Man, first off, thank you for coming out, hanging with your boy. You know what I'm saying? Welcome to Music Changing Lives. This is where we teach kids how to do music, art, fashion, and more. This is our game room that we're actually getting upgraded right now. What you see up here is some images. We teach the kids about culture and heritage, you know what I mean? It's really about them learning who we are as a culture and how we work together to make this place a better place. So we image Cesar Chavez, Lincoln, that signed the Emancipation Proclamation that then freed the man here, Israel Bill. Israel Bill, we highlight him because he developed what's known here as the Lagonia area. So imagine a slave coming and being freed and then actually developing this whole region that we standing on and no homage paid to him. So I had to do something for him. Kennedy said, us, don't think about what your country could do for you, but what you could do for your country. And I stood on that ever since I heard that. Martin Luther King said, I had a dream and I feel I'm that dream and as wild as dreams then came true. So I had to uplift that. Then Obama taught us to have hope. Dolores Horte, the same thing. And then the Judson brothers here is the ones that actually developed this place and made what we now standing in known as Redlands, California. And so that's not it. We have all the other places. Yeah, yeah, so let me take you on a journey. You see what I'm saying? We got the ball for a cause going on. The murals here, I had this painted when I first came here to build the studio. I wanted to teach the kids the importance of art and the importance of music. So I had to show them who are the great elders that opened up the foundation for us that most of these samples come from. And so, you know, we had to highlight those people. I just got noted that I got to add Prince to the wall and a few others. I said they was alive before this was painted, so don't hate me. You know what I'm saying? Then we got the late great Nipsey Hussle over here that we got. You know what I mean? Ooh. Taught us to hustle and motivate like no other. You know what I'm saying? And so shout out to Nip because he was one of the main celebrities that supported me when I first told him about the concept. You see, he said we need more studios like this that teach kids the music biz because of what he seen I was doing here. And so he came out and supported that mission. Oh, yeah, the beautiful art. You know what I mean? I, I, I'm a big believer in giving the kids something beautiful that they've never had in their homes and things that they can see. This is the first record we created from these kids. And then it went digital right after that. So you can find our digital blocks. But this was the incentive. We gave kids this all for free as long as they didn't do drugs promote anything violent or disrespect our community. You could come use my this studio right free of charge. And we give them the best, too. You see, that's the TLM. You know what I mean? That's a $3,500 microphone, maybe 4Gs right now. And there and you it, go. <laughs> I bring them the mix and roll, everything. So there's no excuses when you leave this place. If you literally leave here and don't create something, it's because you didn't want to. We are what's called positive peer pressure, and this model is now a replicable model that not only serves a dual county mission, which is Riverside and San Bernardino County, the two largest counties in the world, mind you, uh, but it's going across the state now. And so thanks to California Endowment and all my partners, I'm able to take this mission throughout the whole state of California soon. And you have Studio A and Studio B. It's right across as we are seeing as well, so they can work as well to do more. more yes, stuff. yes. Let's take you over there as well. So Studio A is meant for the kids that are advanced. Studio B, I built for kids that are more intermediate because I seen they would get intimidated when they came here. And so we want to also teach kids the basics of music, how to write music, how to read music. So this is where you come, you learn how to play keys, you learn how to write scale music, all of those different things, even electronic drums. And now we're working to get this all to connect. So where you can be basically producing a track here and then send it right over to Studio B and get your stuff mixed and mastered instantaneously. But you learn here first the basics, like I said, how to read and write music. And then after you go from that, you then go to the advanced area where you just basically get it off and popping, you know what I'm saying? And so it's a thing like no other. Um, I was a kid that grew up in the music industry thanks to my family, but I would always want to be learning and my brothers didn't have time because at that time, studio hours was about $1,000 an hour between buying the reels, the reel to reels, the dots and all the engineers, you had to have big money to play. And so it was always my dream to give kids something for free to learn. So let me take you on the art side too, because again, like you said, it don't stop. Yes. This yes. Haitian American was thinking wow. on a whole nother level. So That's now amazing. you come over here and you go to our art lab. All right, now let me take you into our art room. So this is where we teach kids all sorts of mediums of art. 
Uh, we basically teach them uh, acrylic, drawing, spectrum. We even do props where they learn how to set film and things like that. Again, it's not too much because we've been uh, closed since the pandemic. Uh, so immediately after March 12th, when they closed down the building, we've been closed. But this is a zone where kids can come learn music, I mean learn art on all mediums. And this mural here is very beautiful statement of what was created. So it's what kids seen before they came to us. Uh, they said they were lost. They were uh, basically, you know, doing drugs, doing crime, things like that. But when they come to the community center, we've uplifted them to have hope and love and unity by teaching them how to do their own art, how to sell their music. We've taught them how to graduate. We've taught them how to buy homes, how to acquire careers. And now we can actually say these kids are actually doing it. So that's what we're here celebrating. 23 years of keeping lights on after school, teaching kids to have hope, teaching teach kids around the world that they could be whatever they want to be and i thank you so much for coming out and taking a moment to just tell the story hope for the community thank you so very much truly an honor yes Appreciate thank you it. love you Patricia, thank you so much for being here. Celebrity Red Carpet put you here at a wonderful event. Why do you think your presence is important here? Uh, being a mother of seven and a grandmother of two, I have to be here because it's bigger than us. It's these kids that are going to provide for us a future. And when we're long gone, we want them to have a future. So it's very important that we're here. We know how our community is deeply impacted by gang violence or any type of violence that our youth are getting into. So you come in here as, not only as a mother but also as a prominent figure in our community yes. to tell them that we as mothers, we have your back. Yes, we do. Um, it's an organization called Mob, Mothers that have lost their children or sons to gun violence. And it's very hard for a mom to lose something that she gave her to. We had it for nine months or eight months or whatever the time frame and be able to not see them grow and have kids and that's very devastating to a mother. So we want our black men especially, any people, just not, not use the gun violence, try to talk it out, try to love one, one another like we're supposed to. It can work if we all put it all together, if all of us come together and do it. That's why I'm here every year. Next year I can't wait, it's getting bigger and better every single year and I'm going to be here. I'm doing this for my kids too. I have four boys, and I'm sorry, I have four men and three young ladies, and I don't want anything, I don't want a tragic saying, woke up somebody tell me that someone's gone that long to me. Yeah. So I really just, I'm here for that. Music, arts, and of course, uh, sports, basketball, Absolutely. can really change life. We see how so many celebrities come in here as well to play with the community. Tell us how you feel as a mother when you see that reunion with, you know, people from the community come into the community. Well, that means it what they're doing is working and someone's being heard they are knowing that this is what needs to be done and they're coming together as a community to make it happen they should try to convince more communities to do the same thing um, they I think they built uh, three basketball courts or something within days that's a very very big thing for uh, a community within itself and having lights for our kids to do other things than do violence, they can have activities happening, extracurricular activity that will keep them out of trouble, even if the lights are on later. So, I, man, I'm just here to see the outcome. I'm here for the outcome. Yeah. And uh, obviously, uh, we hope that the outcome will be positive for the community, Definitely. positive for our young boys in our community. 
What is the message as a mother you would leave here with the young boys in our community in order for them to see a brighter future? Um, the thing is, see within yourself what you need to do to make a, a better place for you to live, I meaning the world. So if you yourself need to fix what's in you first and love on you, you'll know how to love other people and help fix other things around the world. It's almost like self-love, right? I love this world. I want to live in it. I don't want to die in it unless it's a, a cause that is going to be greater than life, which is just me making my mark. So, therefore, I will take care of me as well as my neighbor and my community. And, and you say the key word is all about love. It's all yes. about giving back to a community. Absolutely. With love, we can really make a change. We can make a change, yes. It changes everything. They know that hate causes a lot of things, but love makes great changes. It's a very positive thing. Nasty say it. The great and beautiful Patricia, Patricia, ladies and gentlemen, thank here. You, thank you, thank you so me. much for being here, and we are really honored to have you here. Oh, Getting you. our community, do your work, do your efforts to make sure that you see the change that you always inspired to see. Absolutely, I, I, I made seven babies, and now I got two grandbabies. I gotta do the work. I gotta do the work. We are proud of you. Thank you All so right. much. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. <laughs>so much for being here. I wanted you to explain to our viewers the importance of such a great event in our community. We are balling for a great cause. We are trying to take our kids away from gang violence. Absolutely. I think it's very important that we come together as a community for exactly as you said, our kids. They're our future. They're going to be the future leaders of our society and we have to make sure that they have the equipment, the tools to be successful. Hence, after school programs on top of school, making them able to be creative, uh, innovative, things like that. You are a great role model to our community. They are seeing you as so many hats, right? Basketball player, actor, and humanitarian. First, I want to talk about the basketball uh, life. You know, how is it for you as a professional basketball player also playing basketball in movies? Well, you know, it's surreal for me. You know, I, I used to play overseas. I was a professional basketball player in Germany. In Germany, yeah. I got into a car accident, which ended my career. Uh, fast forward, went back to school, did the law school thing, the uh, MBA thing. And I became an actor. I, well, I modeled for a long time, became an actor, got this HBO show, which was, is playing a basketball player. So it's kind of like it brought my whole career full circle, uh, my two loves, acting and basketball. Yeah. I mean, it's really great because once we have, uh, you know, wonderful black on screen, it's just to reflect our community. It's important. And I, I feel like uh, me being a, having this platform, uh, I, it's a duty of mine to make sure that I represent not only black people, but but men in general as, as a role model for the, the, the next coming group of individuals, our kids mainly. Talk uh, to us about the idea of never giving up. You never give up. You know, you got a car accident, your career somehow stopped on a professional level, but you keep going and do all the things. So I want you to tell me more about that specific aspect. Well, you know, give, never giving up is, we all have circumstances that we deal with. No matter how big or how small, they affect us, right? And so the bottom line is we have to persevere. We feel what we feel. We may feel depression. We may feel any and everything that we feel. But we got to continue to move on. As long as we wake up in the morning, we have an opportunity to change our lives and our circumstances. 
Last but not least, tell us about Lakers Project. It's coming out soon on HBO, as you mentioned. Yes, sir. Well, uh, I'll be playing Jim Jones. Uh, he was on the Lakers team uh, with Magic and Kareem, 79-80 championship team in 80-81. So uh, it's coming out March 6th. HBO, HBO Max, make sure you check it out, and uh, it's going to be a great time. Adrian Brody's on there, Jason, Jason Siegel's on there, uh, Mike Epps, he plays Richard Pryor. So it's going to be a great opportunity. Great, great for, experiences for you as well. Thank you. Absolutely, it definitely is. Joining us now is attorney Alfredo Isaguirre representing Mario Palacios in the case of the uh, assassination of a uh, former president of Haiti, uh, Jovenel Moise, on July 7th. Thank you so much for being here with us, sir. Thank you for having me. Okay, uh, we know that uh, Mario was uh, detained at an airport in Panama, now in, in the United States, especially in Miami. Uh, what can you tell us about the charges uh, presses against him uh, by the uh, U.S. government? Well, he had court yesterday. He had his initial appearance uh, yesterday, January 4th. Um, he's charged with conspiracy uh, to commit uh, murder, um, obviously related to the incident that happened in Haiti. At this point, we are very eager to see the evidence against him um, to see what uh, allegations, if the allegations uh, are corroborated by the evidence um, that the government has. And we're waiting for the government to hand over that evidence in order to see, uh, to prepare our defense for the case. Have you spoke to your client? What can you tell us about so far the first conversation? Uh, no, for, I mean, for now, I've spoken to him. Um, he's at the Federal Detention Center in Miami, and uh, he's going to probably be there until the case is resolved. Um, but until then, we're just eager to fight the case and see what evidence the government has regarding these allegations, which are actually, you know, very serious. Hmm. Uh, at first, we heard that he was supposed to go to Colombia and then now in the United States. Why that change? Um, I believe uh, the U.S. wanted to extradite him to the U.S., uh, obviously here. And uh, when his plane uh, stopped in Panama on his way to Colombia, that's when he was uh, detained by U.S. authorities and extradited over here to the U.S. Hmm. Um, we heard that he said that he's willing to cooperate with the uh, U.S. Uh, justice system. Do we know what he knows and what he can share as far as information with the U.S. government eventually that can help the Haitian government? At this point, it's premature as to what he's going to do with his case or what his position is. As to the case, we're going to wait to see what the evidence shows, and then we'll make a determination. I don't want to, you know, it'd be pure speculation right now to say what he's going to do or not do in the case. He has an upcoming appearance in court. Uh, this month in January, uh, will your client plead guilty or not guilty? Um, he'll probably plead not guilty at that time. Um, we still need to look at everything. By then, I'm probably not going to have enough time to resolve everything and look at all the evidence and make a determination in the case. Both him and I need time to discuss everything. Again, this is a serious case. This is probably not going to get resolved in the next 10 days or 15 days or 20 days. This could probably last months. You are not new to this type of cases. I mean, you've been covering so many huge cases and, of course, you, uh, about international cases as well. What can you tell us when something like that happened? How long that can last, more or less, for you to find evidence, for you to have information to, uh, you know, to defend your, your client and also for the U.S. government to bring information forward, in that case from Haiti, uh, to uh, prove that he's guilty? Um, these cases can be quite complex. Uh, sometimes they're resolved within a couple of months. Sometimes they resolve uh, within a year, something that takes more than a year. Sometimes it requires travel to other countries. Um, I don't know if this case is going to require travel to another country, you know, Haiti, Colombia, so forth, and Jamaica. I'm not sure yet, um, but they're pretty extensive and uh, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Um, 
when will you have access to your client? Obviously, you're representing Mr. Mario, so you have plenty of access to him. Would you have access to him to at least get to know um, what is sense of the case? Um, you, you've obviously followed the case on the news as well, so you know what happened in Haiti. Um, will that happen soon? Uh, yes, I, I have to wait a certain period of time based on the uh, pandemic. Uh, the jail doesn't let me see him immediately and segregates him from everybody else as they do any other prisoner. They segregate him for a specific amount of days in quarantine. After that, I have full access to him, and at which point I will constantly go see him wherever he is. I know you are very great in uh, on TV interview as well. I want you to educate our viewers when it comes to not guilty and guilty plea. What's that supposed to mean? Is it like when, when a client plead not guilty, that doesn't mean the client is not guilty or if the client feels guilty is guilty. So your client is probably will plead not guilty, but that doesn't mean that in the long run they may not find him guilty of the, of, of the case of murder of, of a prisoner of Haiti. Is that right? Yes, um, <clears throat> he pleads not guilty and then the government gives him the evidence. Um, and then after that, then there's a determination made as to whether or not he's going to plead guilty or not guilty as in regards to going to trial. Um, initially, everybody always pleads not guilty. It's almost like a standard where the prosecutor then gives you all the evidence that they have against him. Um, it would be ineffective um, mm -hmm. a lot of times to plead somebody guilty without having reviewed the evidence, without having worked on the case, without knowing anything about the case. Um, you know, it's not normal practice to do that. Um, you have to work the case and see what happened and see what goes on and review all defenses. And then with the client, then make a determination as to what's going to happen with the case. Mm. According to the Haitian government, uh, Mr. Mario Palacios was not acting alone. Uh, you, we have names of uh, at least a dozen of Colombians along with him to commit the, the, the murder in Haiti. Will that happen also that we have to have some of the witnesses like Colombian in Haiti to come to the United States to testify on that case? Is it, is it a possibility so far? Uh, potentially that may, that may be a requirement if, uh, if we decide to go to trial. The prosecutor may have to call witnesses from other countries um, and we may have to go over there and interview them or whatnot. Um, so yes, that is a possibility that witnesses may have to be flown from other countries for this case. And there may be also a possibility of the Haitian government to send um, justice representative from Haiti to bring documents or evidence to uh, prove the case. I imagine it may just be testimony of witnesses um, more than anything else. Um, I don't necessarily know that any uh, legal uh, dignitaries or whatnot from Haiti will have any sort of standing in court um, other than to ask for his extradition. I don't know that they would play any role other than the witnesses that were there that day testifying in a trial. The former lady of uh, hey, a former first lady of Haiti, Martin Moise, uh, was there. Is there a possibility that she may be also one of the person to testify, at least to explain what happened that night? I, I haven't seen the evidence yet. I haven't seen all the evidence, but I imagine that she could, yes, may she may be listed as a witness in the case if she was there and they're trying to prove a case against him that he was in fact there. Most definitely, this is a case that we will follow. Thank you so much, yeah, Attorney no Isagire. And I know that we will follow. We'll do multiple interviews with you as well to follow the case, to educate our viewers, not only in the United States, but also in Haiti, about that uh, special case. Now we know that uh, Mario Palacios is here in the United States, especially in Miami. Thank you so much. Thank you.